first. Thanks. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, you'll have to forgive me my nerves here, but um, I am just so happy to be here, and thank you all so much for for coming out today. I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about myself and my own story and my personal experience that brought me to sort of thinking about all of these issues, and then I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and he's going to do the same. He's going to talk about why what led him here to thinking about this topic, which we think is just such an important topic. Um, so for me, you're probably not familiar with my story, but um, I got sick on a vegan diet. I got very, very sick. And at the time, I was eating a diet that I thought was very, very healthy. And it's something that um, a lot of leaders in our community were telling me was a very, very healthy diet. Um, and I still got sick. And I got so sick that I almost stopped being vegan. Um, I was almost an ex-vegan, like this close. Um, so I find that in our vegan community, people who are ethical vegans, like I am, people who are so sure of their veganism, so resolute in their beliefs, and convinced 100% that they will never not be vegan, um, they can sometimes find it hard to empathize with and to even maybe wrap their brains around why someone would go back, like how someone could possibly consider that. Um, and I think that that's dangerous. Um, I think that that kind of disconnect, that inability to even allow yourself to imagine what might be going on with someone who's experiencing that, creates a distance that is essentially a lack of acknowledgement. Um, and then it becomes really easy to say, well, that person's just crazy, um, you know, they weren't doing it right, or the one that I've been hearing a lot lately, um, they were never vegan in the first place. Because if you were a vegan, a real vegan, you would never go back. So if you're an ex-vegan, you were never vegan in the first place. Um, which is essentially saying they don't count, right? And that pushes it away. And I think that externalizes it. And maybe we do that because it makes it feel like that could never happen to us. It's something that happens to others. It's, we other it, right? Basically, so we don't have to face it. Um, but the truth is that it's there. And um, the unfortunate truth is that it's there in a really big way. Um, the recidivism rate in the vegetarian community is about 75%. Wow. Yeah. We don't have numbers for the for the vegan community. <laughs> um, for the vegan community because those studies just haven't been done. But I would imagine that it's it's really similar, if not higher, just because veganism is more restrictive by nature. Um, most people in the vegetarian community last about five years. That's the average lifespan of a vegetarian. Um, and then they go back to being an omnivore. 75% of them will go back. Um, that is a huge number, right? And so that's what Matt and I are looking at. Um, why is this happening? Why are people going back? And of course, how can we stop it? How can we help them? Um, we think that this is something that our community needs to address. Um, in the vegan community, there's a lot of emphasis on making new vegans, which is super awesome. It's like really important work that needs to be done. But there's not necessarily a lot of follow-up. There's not a lot of resources for people once they've gotten here, for staying here. And um, so that's kind of what we're looking at, how to, how to help people stay here. Um, and like I said, I want to start by telling you my own story. And my hope is that you can see me and hear me, we're in the same room. You can talk to me afterwards, and hopefully you'll be able to connect with someone who considered going back and understand where I'm coming from and maybe find empathy. That's my hope. Um, and hopefully to see that that doesn't make me a monster or a hypocrite or heartless. Um, and actually it's just the opposite. I. Uh, I have so much empathy for people who struggle in their veganism and eventually go back because I know personally that that would have been one of the most painful decisions that I ever had to make in my life. 
Um, so my story. My story is long and complicated, and I'm going to try and give a general overview for Barbie's sake, but we'll see how brief I can actually make this. Um, basically, it started after my son was born. He was about four months old, and I started getting fatigued. That's how it started. Um, but not just like tired, like extreme, extreme fatigue. So much so that um, on some days it was hard for me to get out of bed. It was hard for me to actually move my body. Um, I would get rashes, little bumps all over my body, but mostly on my neck and on my face. And I would get these splitting headaches. Um, and so those along with a bunch of other little symptoms, which kind of seemed like they maybe could be new mom stuff. Keep in mind I was a new mom. I was sleep deprived. Um, and so I didn't really know what was going on. You know, my son was like four months old. He was teething. We weren't sleeping. It was pretty much chaos. So I, I didn't know if this was normal or not. Um, but I noticed that it was, it appeared to be cyclical. It seems to happen on a cycle. So along with this like crushing anxiety and horrible mood swings, which was pretty much constant, um, the other stuff would go away. And I would think, oh, thank God, I'm moving through this. It's over. I can move on with my life. I'm getting healthy again. I can actually focus on my kid. And just when my hopes would start to raise, it would all come back. And that is crushing. Um, having my hopes raised, and this is something that happens to a lot of people who are sick. They start to get better, and then they get worse again. And then they start to get better and worse. And that up and down, that sort of roller coaster, is so psychologically damaging. It just wears you down. It, it's so emotionally difficult. So that went on for months. Um, and first I went to my midwife because I thought it maybe was new mom stuff. And I told her what was going on and she basically blew me off. She said, yeah, yeah, it sounds pretty normal. And kind of gave me the brush off. Um, so from there, it didn't go away. And so I went to an MD, just like a general practitioner, a Western medicine doctor. And he heard all of my symptoms in my situation. And he suggested that perhaps I had picked up a virus one of these little like mild viruses that's really common in babies and toddlers and basically it was the same thing. He basically gave me the brush off. Um, and even when I came back to him six months later, um, and it was still happening, still on a cycle, like half a year later, and he still just brushed me off. So it kept going on for months, for months, and for over a year. I was like this. Um, my dad is a and so I would talk to him about this, and he would say, and he always speaks in terms of Chinese medicine, he would say that my chi was weak, and that I was depleted. And would I please just drink some bone broth? Please just eat a little bit of meat? He would say, just a little bit of fish. <laughs> so, clearly, nobody was willing to help me. No one was able to help me. And I felt completely alone. And, you know, on top of this, I'm a vegan blogger. I'm like a life, I have a pretty popular lifestyle blog. So I have all these people looking at me. I had just released a book. I'm a vegan book. I'm an author. I'm sort of public in this community. And so I felt like... this huge secret that I have to, to hide because our community, we don't talk about this stuff. We're supposed to present ourselves as a shining beacon of you know, optimal health at all times. We do not have a culture of talking about this kind of stuff in our community. And so I felt like a, I felt like a fraud. And because of all of that, I became incredibly depressed so incredibly depressed. And I hated myself, literally. I hated myself. So luckily in the spring of 2012, I saw a naturopath. And for the first time, someone sat down with me and looked me in the eyes and said, oh my god, you're sick. This is 18 months in. You're sick. Let's help you. And she did. She ordered blood tests. Like, shocking. <laughs> 
So shorter blood tests, and this is the long story short. I had extremely low cholesterol. And a lot of people don't realize that that can even be a problem because in the mainstream culture we're taught that like high cholesterol is bad, and so we just assume that low cholesterol is good. We don't really understand that cholesterol is on a bell curve, right? So it goes up and then, you know, up here in like the 300s, that's not good. And then your cholesterol goes down, you get healthier and healthier, and this is optimal. But as it keeps going down, then you start having problems. So like below 150, 130, you run into problems, and my cholesterol was low. And that was inhibiting my body's ability to make hormones. Cholesterol is the precursor to all sex hormones. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, all those hormones require cholesterol in order to synthesize them. So my body was not able to make enough of the hormones. Um, secondly, I had markers for protein depletion. I just want to make that so super clear. I am a vegan who is not getting enough protein. Um, so protein and cholesterol is pretty ironic for a vegan. I think it would be comical if it wasn't so like tragic in my life, but like maybe if there was some B12 deficiency thrown on top, then it would be <laughs> absolutely <laughs> ironic. But, um, so protein and cholesterol. These are two things that I could have gotten really easily from the eggs that were laid by the hens that lived in my own backyard because I rescued hens, right? So what is an egg? It's protein and cholesterol. That's like what it is, right? So there's my answer from rescued hens living happily in my backyard. So my question became, do I eat these eggs? Do I eat these eggs and get better? And I have to tell you, I was so pissed. I, I was so angry at all of the vegan leaders and all of the vegan doctors and all of the gurus who told me that I was eating the healthiest diet on the planet. And all of these people told me that I was doing the right thing and no one warned me that this could happen. No one warned me about this. And I was so furious. Because I was in this situation now where I hated myself. And I was faced with this choice, this horrible, horrible, impossible choice. And the thing that I kept thinking about was even though these chickens that live in my backyard that are well taken care of, potentially, and I'm not actually willing to debate it because it's totally a hypothetical, but potentially those specific eggs in that specific situation were maybe not immoral to eat. Okay? But I had to ask a bigger question which was that if my body requires eating animal foods in order to be healthy, then eating animals can not be wrong, right? That's just, that's a lot that follows logically. If I have to do it, it can't be wrong. But I did think it's wrong, and I do think it's wrong. And so, Thinking about it like that, it was really easy for me to get through my anger, to get to the other side of my anger, by remembering why I'm vegan in the first place, which is I'm vegan for the animals. And so I went to my naturopath, who had been encouraging me to eat the eggs, and they said, we have to find a vegan solution. And I was lucky because she was willing to, and we did. Um, I raised my cholesterol and compensated for my protein issues using entirely vegan foods. And my naturopath was amazing and literally within weeks like literally within weeks i was feeling better and uh, from there it was just a steady incline <laughs> and my health kept getting better and better um until i'm now the happy healthy person that you see before you yay <laughs> so, so my story has a happy ending but here's the thing about my story and this is something that I think is so important. I am an incredibly stubborn person, and I'm also the kind of person who is very comfortable with the idea of doing my own thing, kind of forging my own path. Um, and looking at this issue, I realized that not everyone is like that, right? Like, I'm a nonconformist. Not everyone is nonconformist. I am a nonconformist in everything that I do, pretty much. I do it my own way. 
but not everyone is like that, and that's okay. Like, this isn't a value judgment. I'm not saying I'm better than them and they're worse or vice versa. It's just different personality types. So I'm really aware of that. And really aware that if I were less used to, like, bucking convention, I might have made a different decision. Like, I might have listened to my doctor. I might have listened to my father, you know? I might be in a very different position. So going through that whole experience, um, well, for one, it's left me very humble. And it's also given me, I think, a lot of insight and a lot of empathy for people who end up going back for whatever reason. Because I know that I don't know what's going on with them. Um, and so, yeah, that's what brought me here. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to tell you. Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here, and, and thank you, Sayward, for you know sharing your stories. Like it's definitely not easy, um, and I'm fortunate to be working with Sayward and to be thinking about this. And the first thing I want to talk about is is perspective. And in the introduction, I mentioned I've been vegan 17 years, almost half my life now. I haven't done the math on the number of days, what day that is, or time it would be, but close. And you know, for 10 of those years, I've been a registered dietitian, and that included getting um, a public health degree. And in public health, you learn the psychology and educational theory behind changing people's behaviors. And it's like, wow, this is great. I've been an animal rights activist since I was 17 years old. This is exactly what I want to learn. And I was amazed at what I had learned. And I, I say this you know, over 17 years, you know, not to brag or say that I have the answer to this question, because I don't. You know, if I could figure out how to make everyone vegan and stay vegan, we wouldn't be here, right? Um, but I've gained perspective because I've seen a lot of people come and go. And I see a lot of people convinced that they're right. Which is hard, because it's like nutrition. Um, in the nutrition field, I see a lot of things, even from experts and people that those of us, this, a lot of us in this room probably quote that I don't quite agree with because they're drawing conclusions that are really strong from evidence that isn't as strong. And that's dangerous. You know, have you ever heard a vegan say, oh, you don't want to get a heart attack? Just be vegan, right? Well, that's not the case, right? Or cancer proof yourself. Do you know someone's book? Does anyone know any vegans with cancer? It's like, yes, yeah, we do, right? And so, we have to have a perspective on this, and we have to be sort of realistic because you can't say that you know the answers or you know for sure what, what the science says and how you can change people's behaviors. And so if you're in this room and, and you're a vegan, you're part of a very small minority. You know, the numbers are always changing, so it's hard to figure those things out. Right back to the science, how do we know? But what's the, what are the ongoing numbers for a percentage of people who are vegan in the U.S.? It's like, yeah, between like 1 and 3 percent. It's a really small minority. And I think a lot of us as activists act as if like, like animal liberation is around the corner. If you can just like, just get your friend to not eat eggs, right? And, like, one more Facebook comment and like, we're there. It's funny, but it's, it's not funny. Um, and we need to think about like what a small percentage we are and like the longer arc of where we want to be. You know, I'm also um, really active in in bike advocacy, right? So like I rode my bike here. You know, how many other people rode their bike here? Well why not? You know, why didn't more people? You know, you just buy a bike and you buy the gear and you go on Google Maps and you find the route and you leave early and you ride here. That's right. It's better for the environment, it's better for your health. Why didn't you guys do that? Right? Does that sound familiar? You know? Or someone who does anyone have any friends who love yoga? You know? You're like, shut the hell up. Yeah. <laughs> right? And it's funny because we're like, yo, yoga's not gonna save the world. There are people who think yoga is gonna save the world. And everyone who learned yoga, there would be peace. It's like you go, come on. Right? And I like yoga. <laughs> and I think vegans are in that category. You know, I saw, was it in this group? I tried to stop reading the threads just for this event, and it was so yeah. exemplary of exactly what we're talking about. It's like the irony is just building on top of itself, right? And 
And someone said, um, oh crap, I lost, my, I lost my train of thought with that. Um, oh, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, yoga. Yoga, coming yeah. back, sorry, I just totally got, I got, um, the blog. Yeah, that we, we really think that we are going to change these things so quickly and that we are so right. And our numbers are really small, you know, probably more people who do yoga than are vegans, right? And, you know, the number of bike commuters is probably similar. And we need to think in the long term. And I want to bring up a few things. One is a study at London University, published peer-reviewed study, where 70% of self-identified vegetarians, where they had a choice, actually had eaten meat in the last two days. <laughs> okay, so then how does that affect our numbers and the numbers that we're using? You know, it's like, it's stacked against us. And if you are vegan, you know, like you're saying about being stubborn and like, and being willing to like, no, I'm going to find a way, I'm going to talk to a different doctor, and I'm not going to listen to my dad. If you can do that, you're an exception. Most people can't. And, and that's such an important perspective on where we are and what works for us. And knowing that what works for you might not work for other people. And I see that all the time. It's like... It's like, no, 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 to be a healthy vegan, this is exactly what you do. And you're like, well, that works for you, but where's the research? I don't need research, I trust my body. You know, like, how often do we see that, right? And it's stepping back from that and saying that, well, actually, there are probably a variety of things that can work. And do we have that ability to step back outside of our own experiences to look at what may or may not work for other people? And then that relates to expectations. We put huge expectations on what will happen when someone goes vegan, right? The energy, it's incredible, right? Like, <laughs> is that going to be everyone's experience? And deep down, is that your own experience? Or are you just really excited about it? Confuse <laughs> <laughs> these things. So I've, I've recently done a lot of research on cacao, right, the bean that chocolate's made from. And if you look to that raw food folks, um, you know, cacao is like drug-like, you know, and it's this, you know, they're like, look at the evidence, it's so spiritual, and there's like so much. And so I really, I had an opportunity um, to spend a lot of time looking at the research on cacao, and there's a lot. I mean, thanks to uh, a professor at Harvard who's been looking at this for like 20 years, there are, there's a lot of research on cacao. And, do you know what it is? It's the caffeine. It's the aromine. These actually, sure, it affects people's brains. Yeah, it's freaking caffeine. Right? And, and so the reason I bring that up is most people who become vegan are very excited about it, right? And you're like, holy crap, I'm going to save the world right now. I'm going to save animals. You know, just wait until they read this comment, the best comment that has ever been written. You know? And, and you step back, and I, and I say this, and it sounds kind of pessimistic, right? You know, look, we're only like a 1% minority, and we're not going to see animal liberation anytime soon. That's, that's pessimistic in a way, but it's also like realistic. You know, when we give people unrealistic expectations, they're going to fail. And so if you say you're going to have ton, tons of energy, you know, when I do my vegan athlete talk, I'm like, I'm very careful. I never say, if you're vegan, you can run 100 miles like Scott Jorick. Because that's not the case. I think Scott Jorick could eat whatever the hell he wants and still be just as good. I'm not totally convinced that it's his vegan diet. That's just the reality because we can't really prove that. And the actual amount of research on vegans and their health outcomes is really small and really limited. And a lot of what people are quoting is like, has been taken out of context many times that you can't really say it anymore. And I see this a lot with activists, and I see a lot of a lot of sort of conflict between, for lack of better terms, you know, health vegans and ethical vegans. And I think someone on the comment page tried to like, oh, there's a distinction. If you were never an ethical vegan, you were never really vegan, that sort of thing. And I don't think that matters as much, because if someone is eating a diet that's vegan or a predominantly vegan diet, how they feel and their health outcomes is important to us. And I think I wrote this somewhere on the page, is that a lot of people who stop being vegan then become spokespeople against it. And that's really dangerous. 
And if we look at some of the like health gurus that have gone back, let's name any names, you know, the things that they're saying, it's really bad for the image of veganism. And it's like, well, why did they have that experience? You know, one theory, and again, Sarah and I are just like kind of theorizing on this, is that people are over-restricted. And I see a lot of the, you know, about these debates about oil, should they have oil, should they not have oil, you know? We're not really sure, and it depends who it is that you are talking about, you know? And I think that food, veganism compared to, say, you know, anti-sweatshops activists is very different because it's something you do every day, and it's something that affects your health. And we tend to, another theory, so I'm kind of jumping around here, is that a lot of vegans don't have training in activism. So there's a lot of energy, like, I'm going to change the world without the outlet for it. And it's something, I mean, we're considering if this could become a book. This whole, like, you know, ex-vegan phenomenon. Can it become a book? And, and, and one of the things, if it does, in our, like, very hypothetical outline, is do vegans need training in activism to have an outlet so that we're not annoying vegans? <laughs> because when you don't have an outlet, suddenly, you know, I read someone really posted, you know, someone posted a complaint, oh, I hate that my meat-eating friends post about, post, you know, photos of their dead animal dinners. And someone's like, well, what I do is I just leave a comment every time reminding them of the animal that died. <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm sure that's really effective. <laughs> you know? Back to the yoga thing, right? Well, if you just did yoga, you wouldn't have these health problems. You know, would anyone go, wow, I'm going to do yoga. Thanks so much, crazy yoga person. Facebook <laughs> <laughs> comments. It's, I think we can learn a lot from that. Because I think vegans sometimes are like real life internet commenters, you know? And I, I don't mean to be overly harsh about it, because trust me, I'm just as passionate about it as, as you probably are. But like, we need to look at these things. Um, let me check my notes here. Secondly, thirdly, whatever I'm on, um, building off of being an exception, right? If you're willing to go against what most people do, you're an exception. You know, so that's true for veganism. It's true for cycling. A lot of people who bike commute have a poor, poor have a bad experience <coughs> that can almost kill them, and then it's easier to go back to driving a car. If you're going against what everyone else is doing you automatically have to work harder. And when people say, oh, going vegan is easy, most of those people have been vegan so long that they don't realize all the work that they did. I don't think going vegan is easy. It is for you. It is now. You say, oh, you just order this instead of that. You just get rid of all your clothes and you buy all these new things from this place called Moose Shoes, you know? And it's like, yeah, you have gained information and you've acted on it. But to tell someone who doesn't have that information, doesn't have that perspective, that it's easy, I think is misleading. I taught community college for uh, five years here in Los Angeles. You wouldn't believe how little people think about food. So to begin with, and I think we want to talk about factory farming and this and that, and it's five steps beyond what most people think about in their day. And on that, if you are spending your life being vegan for, other, for the animals, for the environment, that is exceptional too in that you are being selfless. But most people assume it's selfish, right? What's the number, let's like, not the number one complaint, but a big complaint about vegans is like, oh God, vegans, right? How do you tell the vegan at the party? Don't worry, they'll tell you, right? And, <laughs> Because most people are very selfish. Most people are just selfish. It's the reality of the world that we live in in 2014 in the US. Most people are very selfish. So when you say, no, I'm doing it for the animals, they don't believe you. 
They seriously, people say things like, you just want attention. You're just trying to be different. And like, that's ridiculous because we care about the animals. We really do. But people don't believe it. And it's like, that is a barrier. That is a humongous barrier. And so like, how do you approach that? You know, and how do we promote this in such a way that we give people reasonable expectations and then as a community or a movement or however you want to define veganism and vegans, how do we keep people engaged with this? And as we talk about this, we're thinking it's like, you want to have community, right? You want, it for any social movement, you have to have a community aspect. You have to have people that you can go to, that you can talk to, that can be your support network. For anyone doing anything different, cycling, we have lots of that. You know. <coughs> but you almost don't want to have too much community where it becomes your identity. Because then you feel like if you don't want to wear a different vegan t-shirt every day, <laughs> then you're not vegan enough, so the community might reject you, so I'm not going to hang out with them, maybe I don't need to be totally vegan, <coughs> slippery slope. It's just easier at Thanksgiving to eat what everyone else is eating. And so it's this sort of, it's, it's almost like a catch-22, right? You're a community, but not too much. <laughs> and how do we navigate that? How do we answer that question? Like, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not, but we need veganism to go beyond the identity of being vegan, right? And trust me, like, I put myself out there as, as a public figure and give talks, and people have told me I'm not vegan enough. <laughs> um, someone told me, and I've never had this verified, um, and I looked. They said I wasn't vegan because ref um, enriched flour, that the B vitamins it's enriched with are slaughterhouse byproducts. And it was a vegan who refused to eat any flour. And so he's like, oh, I'm still vegan when I was making something. I said, well, so am I. He's like, oh, no, actually, flour, white flour is not vegan. White sugar, too. Yeah, which, yeah. And I, the white sugar thing was actually a tipping point for me about 10 years ago. Where I was like, you know what? This is distracting from the bigger issues. When someone hands me something to boycott Tofuti, don't buy Tofuti ice cream. I won't suffer because of the sugar. Like, really? This is our issue? This is where we're going to spend our time? You know? And I've been told that there are only like two kinds of bicycle tires that have rubber that is totally vegan. And that if I don't run those tires, I'm not vegan. <laughs> And it's like, wow, is this a productive use of your time? So should I stop what I'm doing? You know, should I stop educating people about vegan nutrition because there might be a small amount of animal products in my bicycle tires? And I think a lot of vegans, that's where their energy goes. Yep. And then now it's not like, <laughs> and, and now I'm like, well, Matt got up there and talked about Facebook comments and then complained about vegans. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I hope you get more out of this than just those two things. But it is a big part of, of, of what we're doing and what we hope would continue to exist. Um, anything else? Oh, we, could, we, we looked at some categories of what pulls people out of veganism. And, and, and maybe after this, we'll kind of open up the floor to discuss it. But what I have seen, one has been health, which I think is over-restriction, and also misunderstanding of medicine and nutrition, you know? And, um, for example, if you eat meat and it has iron and you're iron deficient, you don't get the iron as soon as you swallow it. <laughs> have you read this? I've read this like three times. And then I ate meat for the first time in 10 years. And as I felt it go into my stomach, and I immediately had more energy, right? <laughs> That's hilarious, right? What an idiot. But people believe this sort of thing. And a lot of people don't understand nutrition, don't understand medicine, and veganism gets wrapped up in this sort of mistrust of Western medicine. And that's not an argument I want to have, but as someone who's trained, you know, I've got a formal Western education, it's like, well, this is what we have. If you are tired on a vegan diet, maybe you should go get your labs to see what your iron is, to see what your B12 is. But people don't want to do that. And they say, oh, my iron was low, so I ate meat. Well, you could do it other ways without having to eat meat. And again, like, say with an example of someone who, like, did a lot of legwork and put up with a lot to stay vegan. 
And to expect people to do that on top of everything else and how hard it is. And, oh, you're still doing that diet? You know, someone, a family member says at Thanksgiving? You know, that's hard. And it wears on you. And especially for people who have left the community. I got into veganism through music, through punk rock. And I've, I've come out of that. And a lot of people who have as well gave up their politics with it. And so how do you help people maintain their politics and their veganism without being part of this um, you know, movement or scene or identity or whatever you want to say? Stay punk. Stay punk. <laughs> <laughs> Says the lawyer. Um, <laughs> um, so that's, that's one aspect. Another is um, spiritual. Um, I, have, I know a number of ex-vegans that got into spirituality and Buddhism and give up veganism, which I find hypocritical <laughs> in a lot of ways. But it has happened often enough that I'm shocked by it. And I, I asked someone who is an ordained Buddhist monk, seven years of studying Buddhism. And he's like, well, I don't know. I restrict in so many other ways. It's just one less thing I had to think about. That was his answer. <laughs> seven years. You know? He was just like, you know, we do so much when we're at the monastery that when I get a chance to go away, He's like, I don't want to tell someone how to make their burrito. I just get whatever. Yeah, I and mean, we can like point the finger at that person, and you know, and but I think that's telling of a bigger picture. He's not the only one. Um, burnout relates to what I brought up originally about how we want to free all the animals right now, right? That's not happening. <coughs> And we just think, you know, if only we can get Mark Fitman to stop putting creamer in his coffee, right? <laughs> I'm going to send him a tweet right now, you know? <laughs> and it's building a, a bigger foundation so that we don't burn out. So it's like, I can't believe my cousin still eats eggs. It's like, well, cousin's going to still eat eggs. Let's move on. And how can we just be a positive example, you know? And I've had multiple people say to me, wow, I can't believe you're vegan. And I said, oh, why? And they're like, well, you don't talk about it incessantly. <laughs> and maybe the argument against that is I could have had an opportunity to educate people, and I didn't because I was quiet about it. But on the other hand, just being a quiet example of a healthy vegan. And then having an outlet for activism so that you can do those things, so that you can feel like your energy is going towards something. And that way, every single meal that you eat doesn't turn into activism. Right? Social, spiritual, health, burnout. The last thing I have on here um, that sort of sums up a lot of, of what I, I think about this topic is that it's important to take yourself seriously, but not too seriously. You know, that's kind of something that I live by. It's like, okay, this is serious. Like, I've spent seven years studying nutrition. I need to take myself seriously as an expert on this so that I can educate people about veganism. But I don't know everything. I can't take myself too seriously. And, and I think that that's a lesson for a lot of people. And I see a lot of people around me who I think can learn from that. You know. So that is my part of this. Um, we would like to open this up and have a civilized discussion. <laughs> <laughs>